Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> well, extraordinary times we are living in at the moment. So um, I posted the video of Andy and myself discussing SVB, and you know that that is going to be the main topic and the cause of fluctuations in the market next week. I really uh, cannot predict now what CPI is going to be, so I thought it's really pointless trying to uh, look in too much detail at the technicals, because the technicals, I think, next week are likely to get swamped by this word, disintermediation. What does that mean? Uh, that basically means that we have a huge danger that very large sums of money will be looking for new homes and a different way of depositing themselves because of the $250,000 limit that the FDIC has to insure deposits. So now if you have more than $250,000 at any regional bank, and I'm not talking about the main money center banks, the ones that are covered by, uh, uh, by the stress tests and that we know are not uh, holding uh, ridiculous positions, uh, unhedged positions in bonds or mortgages, but it will affect them as well. You have this word which is going to swamp uh, all activity and let's have a look at how much uh, money is sloshing around, which probably at some stage over the very short term needs to find a different, a new home. So this is the size of the problem. Basically, something like five and a half trillion dollars are deposited with small banks. And we'll say that those are the regionals and the community banks. And the estimates are that something like 50% of that money is not insured by the FDIC. So with different estimates, let's call it between friends a $2 trillion problem. So if you have um, anything over $250,000, you, uh, you are not insured. And therefore, a lot of people had, A, no idea that that was the limit, but B, they're getting paid very little interest on it. I mean, for example, Chase, I mean, I know Chase isn't part of this group, but I'm just trying to describe to you uh, how the system looks. Chase is paying me on my deposit account 0.05%. And that's only because I'm a really, really good customer. Now, I can get, what, 475 in a money market. So what did I do? I moved all my money out of my deposit account, left nearly nothing in my Chase account, and put it all in a money market fund. Well, that is what this $2 trillion here is more likely than not to do, plus certainly a, you know, some proportion of the money sitting in deposit accounts over 250,000, even with Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, and down the list. So you're talking about many trillions of dollars. That is big. So many trillions of dollars will be leaving the uh, deposit side of banks and going into much more, much better yielding money market deposits. Uh, sorry, money market funds, whether those are floating rate notes or they're literally money market funds or whatever they happen to be. They are also, and they're regulated, so you know that, you know, that there are no shenanigans going on. And also the, uh, the yield is much better and this has got to happen relatively quickly. It's going to happen in the space of, you know, one, two, three weeks maximum. So what is going to happen? You're going to have a whole load of money uh, being taken out of the deposit side of the banks 
and being put on money markets and other short-term instruments. Okay, so now that we've determined that a lot of money is going to be headed the way of money market funds, this is the Vanguard Federal Money Market Fund, which is one of the largest funds. Let's have a look at what they buy. Look at the average maturity, 13 days. Weighted average life, 42 days. And let's go down and have a look what they own. Basically, all very short dated bills and FRNs and everything issued by the government. And they're huge, right? I mean, these are huge sums of money that are going to be parked. We're talking about trillions. And they're going to be buying very, very short-term paper. And that is all they're going to be buying. So what is going to happen to um, these regional banks when the you know, people start pulling deposits? Well, they're going to have to deleverage, aren't they? Uh, if they are leveraged when a deposit comes in, so a deposit comes in and they buy, I don't know, times five levered, uh, longer term paper, let's say they buy five years, 10 years, and they don't buy th 30 years, uh, or mortgage, mortgage backed securities or whatever, well, they're going to have to delever. They're going to have to uh, give the customer their money, who goes and gives it to the money market fund, who then puts it in here, who then, and, and then Vanguard goes and buys 13 day paper. While on the other side of the equation, the, the, uh, the regional bank, who has uh, just lost the deposit, needs to delever the other side, i.e. he needs to sell whatever he bought leveraged when the deposit came in. Fairly simple. So really what I'm telling you is the yield curve needs to steepen. So the beneficiaries are going to be the shortest, shortest, shortest maturities. Everything else is speculation, okay? So let's have a look at what happened on Friday and where I think the market has got it wrong. EDH23 is going to expire in a very few days and that moved nothing. So, and you really can't do that you know, anything with that. You got EDH, EDM23, and this is a daily chart of EDM23. Now, it's trading at 94.41. I know this is ED and you can't do anything, but you just add 26, basi 26 basis points and you've got the uh, SOFA. So here you have 94.41 and the Fed funds rate is 94.77 all right you can see it here the comparable fed funds so there's a spread of what 27 plus 9 35 basis points so what the market is telling you is that there's going to be a 35 basis point spread between uh, fed funds and three-month interbank i think that that is unlikely to persist simply because there will be so much demand for very short-term bills that the banks won't know, the big money center banks will not know what to do with that money. Okay, what are they going, who are they going to lend it to? I think the very short-dated uh, euro dollars and uh, the, the sofas are going to go towards Fed funds. They might even dip below Fed funds. I've seen that several times when banks are just absolutely awash or the system is absolutely awash with this kind of money. Almost a riskless trade. Naturally, there's no such thing as a riskless trade. It all depends what CPI is and stuff like that. But I really think that this is uh, almost riskless if you buy if you buy this contract, I think it will trade up here. I will tr think it trades 9480 uh, without any problems. And that's a 40 basis point move from here. The very short end is going to be absolutely awash with liquidity. 
I mean, and let's have a look where it is. It is exactly where it was four days ago. Okay, so it's not like it's rallied. I, I, I think that this is almost a no-brainer that it goes and trades at least to here simply because of the technicals. And this is nothing to do with CPI, nothing what to do with the Fed's going to do. Let's face it, <clears throat> the Fed only has now two possibilities. Unless CPI is absolutely horrendous, the Fed can only do 0 0.25. 0 because they're a bunch of chickens and they're afraid um, of you know the long-term fallout from uh, the, this uh, SIVB debacle, or 25 because they say let's you know let let's err on the side of caution, and that it's in itself is a yield curve steepener, because if the Fed is giving up on inflation fighting because it has some fears. Uh, and there's huge amounts of money coming into the very short end, plus the the long term the the regional banks are deleveraging when they when they lose the deposit side. To me, that everything here says it's a yield curve steepener. So now here we have three months against ten years. And actually, it flattened on Friday. And this is why I think the, um, the market got it wrong. The beneficiary is going to be the very, very, very short end. I think that this spread is actually going to collapse. But everything else, the market got right. So basically, uh, two years, 10 years flattening, I think couple of days here and then it flattens and then we have the uh, two sturdies they got that right and don't forget that what I'm telling you is that these banks are going to have to sell their longer duration paper as they lose the deposit side so the longer end is going to be very volatile while the short end is going to be a relentless bid because as the money gets transferred into the money market funds or whatever it else it is, it's just a relentless bid. Uh, it, the money market funds are going to have so much money over the next week or two weeks that all they're going to be able to do is press the buy button all day from the start of trading till the end of trading. They, they might not have enough time to invest all the money they're going to get. You know, I showed you, it's trillions of dollars. Uh, are there enough bills? Is there enough three-month paper? Because at some stage, when there, isn't, when there aren't enough bills, what's going to happen? The banks are going to lower their bids in, in the interbank market uh, for funds. And it's very, very possible that three-month bids by the banks, uh, Fed funds rates, or that the Fed fund rate itself collapses. It's a self-reinforcing, vicious circle. The short end, I really believe, is going to go a long way down, much further down than the longer end. And I think the longer end might actually be under pressure. So I would do a barbell of everything. I would buy the very, very, very short end, like you know, like crazy, because let's face it, the the risk there uh, of rates actually going up is almost non-existent. I can't say non-existent because we have CPI; it could be horrendous, and then you just get a better level to buy it at, and I'd average in. But everything else. Every other part of the curve, to me, is going to flatten, i.e. go down back towards zero. You have five thirties, which technically look absolutely great. They touched that 42, 43 level, and bang, they can go quite a long way. They can go all the way back down to minus 10 over the course of a couple of weeks. And then you have um, the my favorite which is the tens 30s and i think this has very little risk because every time it goes negative i mean 
here it's positive on this chart but historically every time it's gone negative it's gone positive again and if and i'll show you the one month chart again from these levels it always goes back towards the 70 60 70 level so I know this is much longer term, but in the short term, I see absolutely very little danger and a very compelling macro and technical argument for buying the very, very, very short end against everything else. Germany, don't forget we have the ECB and this is the Schatz. Now, this is being dragged by the US, as we will see in a second. It might easily come back here, but this is a continuation of buy put spreads because it's going higher. It's going to reach, uh, you know, 340 and even higher. Bobble, I think around 245 put spreads around in the t in the 10 year, you know, around 238 to 236. Again, that's what you do. You keep on doing put spreads against the U.S., Look at the, uh, if we have a look at the cross US against Germany, you will see what I mean. This, I think, is going to go a lot lower, twos, twos. I think it's going to go a lot lower now. Um, and I think, you know, around here, around 100. So that's another 50 basis points. Germany and the US are in completely different territory. You just buy the, uh, you know, the short end of the US and, you know, you can spread it here, but it's going to go a long way, these spreads. And if we look at the fives, fives, I mean, look at it. To me, the odds are now that we break a lot lower back down here to 91. It might take weeks. It might take, you know, even a couple of months. But I think the direction of travel is clear now. Tens, tens, you know, right on support. So twos, twos on support, fives, fives on support, tens, tens on support. But it's the kind of support that doesn't hold forever. And again, they're all going down towards the 100 level. So which tells me that the US curve is going to uh, come, you know, it's going to steepen considerably and it is the best risk reward to do it in the US, spread it against Germany and spread it against the longer end. The dollar, to me, all the danger now is to the downside, simply because of the movement in the uh, differentials, in the interest rate differentials. And also the fact that, you know, confidence might be shaken in the U.S. banking system, blah, blah, blah. I know that is all rubbish, but I think the danger is to the downside. Uh, I think there are worse trades than buying a put uh, or a call in the, uh, on the yen and or on the uh, euro. But the yen makes more sense to me because the, um, you know, any any fear, any flight to safety and so on tends to boost the yen. You know, a little bit of each, uh, all basically just sell some DXY with a stop above 106.25. I think it should basically trade lower. And that is all I've got to say about it. I think the risk reward is to the downside at the moment. I really can't see what is going to make it rally uh, hard. Uh, you, there might be some volatility on CPI, there might be some volatility on ECB, there might be some volatility on the Fed, but, and that is why I'm saying buy, you know, uh, puts on the dollar, i.e. calls on, on the Euro USD. Well, we can have a look at uh, Euro USD, something to me, something like a 106 call uh, and just leave it for two or three months. That to me is more likely to trade 110 than to break through uh, through these levels around 105, 20, 104, 61. But if it does, that's your signal that you're completely wrong and you have to rethink your strategy. 
really from here it should not break these level is should basically push higher it, it's a decent risk reward trade to buy some calls on euro usd and if it goes through these levels then you know you're wrong and you can dump it three month calls why not gold same story as the dollar it should be a natural beneficiary because a of the you know if i'm looking for a lower dollar that should benefit it and b it should get the benefit from uh, lower short-term rates and you know the panic all around underreacted i thought on friday you know did it go down no it went up i mean like if we ever look at a chart here it went up but it went up in a very orderly manner and basically all it did is touch the um, the uh, bollinger bands the upper bollinger band and you know just sort of stayed there very non-impulsive very sort of technical and it really gold if i'm right should start getting impulsive very soon so let's uh, assume let's have a look at the possibilities of what the fed reaction function might be if the fed uh, well let's step back if cpi is bad and there are no revisions for the previous months then everything that Powell said in his testimony is correct. Uh, the data, if they are truly data dependent, warrants probably a 50 basis point hike at the moment. If they don't do that, some people are talking even Fed rate cuts. Fed cuts we are not, you're not going to get that would be ridiculous put it this way if they cut rates i will sell every bond that i own and i own quite a few um, and i don't care whether it's one day to expiry or 30 years to expiry i am selling every bond that i own i am selling i'm getting rid of all the uh, money market instruments that i have and I am buying something like 50% equities, 50% gold. Why? Equities, because they're nominal. Uh, their value is nominal. You're going to get an acceleration of growth and an acceleration of inflation as the Fed you know, has just cut rates. And gold is going to just do a complete moonshot. So there you have it um if the fed cuts that's what you do if the fed does zero when you should have done 50 it's the same as having cut really but to a lesser degree and it's not as on steroids if they did cut because if the data warrants 50 and they do zero that means that they are abandoning to an extent the flight against inflation and that again steepens the yield curve 30 years should not like it the short end should love it you can see the theme you do this uh, you do the steepener first you buy some calls on gold or call spreads you buy some uh, put spreads on the dollar uh, and you just see what happens you will know very quickly if you're wrong but I think the odds are that you won't be. Equities, what to say? All the damage was done basically in the uh, last two days because of um, SIVB and because of the regional bank index getting uh, absolutely mullered. By the way, the regional bank index is not a buy because if what i said at the beginning is true the disintermediation that means that regional banks have a very very bad future i.e their prospects of growth are about you know zero so i wouldn't buy that at any price i suppose as a price i'd buy that but it's not here i just don't see the point of buying that regional bank index it's probably the worst thing out there 
So, what is going to happen to equities? Don't forget that equities are always expressed in nominal terms. These are not in real terms. If the Fed were to, um, and I know we're not going to get that next week, but I'm just preparing you for what the Fed might or might not do. If the Fed were to hike now less than um, than it should do because of the data, i.e. becomes less data dependent and more a rabbit or a chicken, which let's face it, that's what they really are. They're not serious people, uh, these Fed governors. This is where you are looking to buy calls on the, this index. 37, 11, 24. Okay, so you buy 37, 25 calls. You have the 200 week moving average still going positive. To me, you buy, if it gets down there over the course of the next two weeks, to me, you buy a 37, 25 call and you spread it against a 39, 43 call uh, for two or three weeks. And, you know, my favorite direction of travel will be between these two lines. If on Monday, and don't forget, I'm, you know, I'm doing this on Sunday uh, morning and I have no idea if there's going to be a resolution, an emergency resolution to the, uh, to the situation at um, SIVB, uh, which will basically uh, make the stock market a little bit euphoric on Monday morning. The place you're looking to buy puts at is around the 3980 level and that is not unrealistic at all okay because a we are through the uh, the, uh, the bollinger bands on the close if the situation is resolved there's going to be an almighty yay hello good days this is but this is and don't forget we were trading 3940 on friday weren't we it will Take out all the stops at 39.40, take it to 39.50, 60, easily 70, and that's where you want to sell it. Or you want to buy puts, something like 39.65, 39, you know, you get the idea. You want to buy some puts there. Because in terms of the economy, this is not over. In terms of the the short end, to me, uh, disintermediation is not particularly bullish stocks and it's really not particularly bullish bonds. Uh, it's bullish the very, very short end, but that really has nothing to do with the price of stocks. So if the stocks start rallying like mad, uh, that's the kind of level that you want to buy some put spreads because they're likely to come down. But on a panic, to around this 3715 level you definitely want to have them and if we look at a clean chart let's enlarge the clean chart and have a look at all these levels 3722 there are gaps down 3645 is a gift so uh, but I wouldn't wait for it. It's unlikely to happen. I mean, I'd double up there, but this 37.22 level is really, really good. And I think it's a wonderful level to buy some two, three week call spreads uh, without any doubt. And finally, one for long term players. This is my famous chart of the 13-week bill versus the five-year note and XLF. And basically, these jaws always close. Now, I think that this differential, as I told you at the beginning, is going to start moving in as XLF comes in. So XLF is going to remain weak. That is going to... Uh, continue the pressure on SPX but at some point whether that is 3725 or whatever it is this will have come in enough for S for XLF to be ready to do a bounce and that's going to take place over the next several weeks I want this jaw to close like this 
See this period back here in, in 2020, these jewels closed and it was then it was ready for XLF to do a run. So this is basically saying to me that XLF could easily break the lows in October. From October of, uh, of, of what is this? This is actually uh, June of last year. And if it does, it's going to come in to about here. What, and then these jewels will have closed and then you are ready to buy XLF like crazy. Nothing to happen, you know, that's going to happen at the moment. At the moment, what this chart is telling you is avoid XLF. So if you're avoiding XLF, you're definitely avoiding the regional banks. So that is why it's not a buy now. So don't, do not be tempted to buy the financials now. It's the wrong time. When this chart closes, of the uh, these jewels close that will be the time to start buying it and i really think that this reaction of the 13 week bill against the five year note on friday was absolutely wrong and it's going to go boom like that just like it did here i mean look at it i'm very 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 bullish the very short end uh, and that leads to disintermediation or is a result of disintermediation. And then XLF is actually not what you want to buy. It's actually probably what you want to keep on selling. And finally, one for long term players. This is my famous chart of the 13 week bill versus the five year note and XLF. And basically, these jaws always close. Now, I think that this differential, as I told you at the beginning, is going to start moving in as XLF comes in. So XLF is going to remain weak. That is going to uh, continue the pressure on SPX but at some point whether that is 3725 or whatever it is this will have come in enough for S for XLF to be ready to do a bounce and that's going to take place over the next several weeks I want this jaw to close like this see this period back here in, in 2020 these jaws closed and it was then it was ready for XLF to do a run. So this is basically saying to me that XLF could easily break the lows in October. From October of, uh, of, of what is this? This is actually uh, June of last year. And if it does, it's going to come in to about here. What, and then these jewels will have closed and then you're ready to buy XLF like crazy. Nothing to happen, you know, that's going to happen at the moment. At the moment, what this chart is telling you is avoid XLF. So if you're avoiding XLF, you're definitely avoiding the regional banks. So that is why it's not a buy now. So don't, do not be tempted to buy the financials now. It's the wrong time. When this chart closes, of the uh, these jaws close that will be the time to start buying it and i really think that this reaction of the 13 week bill against the five year note on friday was absolutely wrong and it's going to go boom like that just like it did here i mean look at it so i'm very 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 bullish the very short end uh, and that leads to disintermediation or is a result of disintermediation. And then XLF is actually not what you want to buy. It's actually probably what you want to keep on selling. Uh, so do not be tempted to buy XLF on a bounce because, you know, it, it, it can certainly bounce. But the, uh, the macro winds are against it for a considerable period of time.
Just for emphasis, I want to show you a chart of KRE, which is the regionals against SPY. I mean, when was it a good idea to buy KRE uh, over the course of the past decade? Never. And certainly that time is not now. Okay, so do not be tempted to buy it on a bounce. You know, do things bounce, of course. But I think it's definitely going to go and test the lows. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's 20%, isn't it, to go down here relative. It's definitely going to go and test down here and I think break these lows and that will be the time to start thinking about a decent bounce. But this disintermediation is not going to take a day, it's not going to take a week. People are going to, you know, they're going to, there's going to be rushes and then lulls and then rushes again and th this money has to be allocated and the regional banks have got to reduce their balance sheets. This is all stuff that's going to take many weeks. So do not rush into it. There is absolutely no reason to buy it now. Uh, I think it's going to test the, uh, the lows. I think it's going to break the lows. And we will have plenty of time to go in and scoop these up when the right price hits. The right price is definitely not now. Thank you very much indeed. And I'll tweet to you on Monday.